Hi, I'm Paul Morin with the Energy Conservatory and welcome to our webinar titled Single Family Residential Air Leakage Testing. And a few housekeeping items first. If you're having trouble hearing the audio, go to the meeting pull down menu and choose the audio setup wizard and go through that uh, setup and hopefully that'll take care of any of those um, issues you're having. Uh, please type in questions as you think of them and we'll be typing in re responses to questions as we go through and then at the end we'll, we'll take some time I'll review some of those questions and, uh, and go over those with the group and then at the end also you know if you want to save your questions for the end that's that's totally okay too and then we can go through some of those questions at the end of the webinar. There'll be a link to our webinar on our website. As we always do, all of our past webinars are available at our YouTube site. And from our uh, website, there is a, on the upper right, as you see on most websites, you can, you can choose, um, you know, get some options, Twitter or, or um, Facebook or LinkedIn. And there's a, there's a little icon there for YouTube. So you can go to our website click that icon for YouTube. It's a little uh, symbol of a camera and that'll take you to, to uh, all our previous recorded um, websites on our video. And, and to see more of them, some of them come up right away and other ones you have to click the video tab to access all of our videos on there. And, and it's pretty extensive um, selection of, of videos that you can watch on all of our equipment. And as always, we're looking for feedback on what kind of webinars you'd like to see in the future. So you can either um, um, type those in as a question, so we'll have a record of them, or um, um, send us an email, and we, you know we'd like some some input from you on what type of webinars, specific webinars you'd like to to see in the future. And you know, as as uh, if, if we don't cover um, your question during the webinar, we will be responding to all of them uh, via email too. So one way or another, you'll get a response to any questions we have. And uh, as we have for the past few webinars, you will, um, if you're looking for BPI CEUs, those are the only CEUs we have at this time are, are BPI, uh, Continuing Education, unit credits and um, so if you signed up for those then then you will receive them and um, the credits are determined by BPI how many credits you'll get for this webinar um, and um, we, we do not or BPI does not send a completion certificate that, that shows how many credits you're getting so you'll need to check your BPI site then and check up on how many credits uh, were given to you. And um, we don't have control over that. That's, that's up to BPI. Um, if you haven't provided your BPI number yet, um, send us an email and we can make sure that we get that information at BPI. So our agenda today, we're gonna cover just the blower the basics, you know, basics of a blower door test and what, what that entails. Um, We'll, we'll be talking about issues affecting accuracy and advantages of using software. So at its most basic level, um, a, during, a, during a blower door test, um, mass flow out equal mass flow in. So um, in the, the DG700 doesn't directly read mass flow so, so there are some conversions that need to be done based on changes in indoor and outdoor temperature, the differences, and, and the altitude at which you're doing the testing. Um, so you'll get accurate numbers of mass flow. And we're testing, when we do a blower door test, um, we, we refer to that, that 50 Pascal pressure we're testing at, we refer to that as an induced pressure difference. And, and what that means essentially is um, the, the fan is causing a change of 50 pascals in the house. Uh, on a windy day or on a, on a cold day with a tall building, 
you might have a, a baseline reading, we'll refer to that, that initial reading without the fan on and the fan capped. Um, your baseline reading uh, might, be, might be five pascals, and um, that, that can make a big difference in your blood air reading. If, if, um, so if it's negative five pascals, you want to be testing at, at negative 55 um, to get that five pascals of induced pressure. If you're entering the baseline um, into your gauge, that essentially zeroes that out. So if you have a, um, a baseline of negative five, it, it subtracts that negative five. And so the, the pressure being displayed on your gauge is the induced pressure. So um, when you push the baseline button and, and push start, then it, what's displayed on channel A is the, um, the long-term average. So the longer you let it run, it'll, it'll average all the numbers it's seen so far. And, um, and on the right channel, uh, channel B, it, it's counting off in seconds. So um, once that number on channel A stays the same for about, you know, four or five seconds, then push enter and enter that baseline into the gauge. You'll have to leave that run longer on windy days for that uh, number to calm down. And I typically, I, I mean, personally, I don't let it run more than 60 seconds, but, but you can certainly let it run longer than that if you've got a really windy day. So that's, that's the essence really of, um, of a blower test. Um, the uh, airflow that's coming out through the fan, an equal amount um, must leak in. So whenever you turn on a fan, an equal amount is, is leaking in instantly or almost instantly. Um, and uh, and we, wanna, we wanna be displaying the induced pressure difference. If you're in an area where it's always 75 degrees inside, 70 degrees outside, and it's never windy, then baseline isn't as important. But um, the colder and windier your climate is, the bigger effect it's going to have. Um, so the bloater is used to uh, blow air into or, or out of a house. You can either pressurize or depressurize a house. Um, so you've got air coming from, from all directions. If you've got ductwork in the house, you'll, you'll get air. If the ductwork is leaky, you'll get air coming through the ductwork um, during a blower dart test too. So if you're doing both a duct blaster and a blower dart test, you want to do the blower dart test first. You don't want to start sealing up your registers and then doing your blower dart test or you'll miss all of that, that air coming in through the ductwork from the outside. Um, you want to in, in adjust the fan until you're changing the pressure in the house by 50 pascals and the flow through the fan needed to create a 50 pascal change is the house tightness and usually that house tightness is referred to as a CFM 50 uh, airflow through the fan at 50 pascals required to change the pressure in the building by 50. So how does the blow door measure flow? Um, the blower door fan has a flow sensor mounted on the inlet side of the fan, the side of the fan that has the rings on. And here's a kind of a blow up view of that flow sensor. And, and it has four tiny holes on the sides of it. And it measures pressure as the air is moving across the, through the fan. And it has a tube connected to it. And um, in this cross section, you can see here's the flow sensor there's a tube running up to that tap. And, um, and then we connect to that tap to channel B on the fan, and um, channel B on the DG700 rather, and um, the DG700 is reading pressure. It's, the DG700 is always reading a pressure. And it's converting that pressure, it's reading from the flow sensor to flow based on which device we choose and, and the default. If you've only ever used a, a blower door 3 fan, you probably you may not even be aware that there's a device button that you can push to change it to blower door or true flow or whatever device you're using. And, um, um, or duct blaster. So the, based on which device you've chosen and which configuration, ring configuration you've chosen, it converts that pressure at the flow sensor to flow. Um, so that's 
that's uh, basically what, what we're doing there. Um, so the things that can affect the, the accuracy of your blow dart test, um, how you set up the building uh, can make a big difference. Um, one, one example of many is if you have a um, attached garage, you leave that, that overhead garage door open or closed during the test. And that can make a big difference, especially if, if you've got a situation where the, the garage is fairly tight and you have living space above the garage, um, it can make a big difference in your blower door numbers, whether that overhead door is opened or closed during the test. Uh, wind can certainly have a big effect, and we'll go into a little more detail on how to deal with wind. And, and these are in the order of, of magnitude on, on things that can, can really affect your test. Um, how you set up the building can have the biggest effect because you might leave a window open. <laughs> so, uh, and wind on a really windy day can certainly have a big difference. Air density correction, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and, and you want to be following a test procedure, and we'll talk about some test procedures and protocols um, that can make your, your test more accurate and more repeatable. And, and certainly the accuracy and calibration of the equipment is important. You want to follow the instructions on, on um, Appendix A of our floater manual on how to check the gauge and the fan for, uh, uh, for proper um, do, a, do an accuracy check and, and do a calibration check of the equipment and, and get your gauges um, calibrated every two years. And we have other, uh, many other webinars on, on accuracy and, and uh, um, other ones on, on blow that go into more information about, about checking calibration. So how a building is set up is, is pretty important and the the um, best protocol we've seen is, is the one, is, is the ResNet protocol on how to set up the buildings, the specific um, parts in this document that talk about how to set up the building. So this is um, the, the uh, set of ResNet standards and the chapter that, um, that we're gonna be interested in is, is chapter eight of that document. And if you do a Google search for ResNet chapter eight, it'll get you right to that chapter that has the information about blow dart testing and duct blaster testing and we're going to specifically go over that information on how to set up the building um, so if you're if you're doing a test and um and maybe it's for code compliance and and the standard is three air changes per hour and and the house is at two air changes per hour or four air changes per hour. It's not as critical that your test is accurate and repeatable, but if you're at 2.9 or, or 3.1, you're really close, then the accuracy becomes really important because the builder might get a, say, well, you know, I'm gonna get somebody else to, to confirm that test. And, and they may come up with a, with a different number. That's the difference between a pass and a fail. And if you're referring to a standard on how you set up that building and you're always setting it up that way um, and, and you're making the temperature and altitude adjustment, um, you, you've got pretty firm ground on, um, on that, that your test is accurate and repeatable. So um, details on setting up the building. Um, it, it's really important to make sure doors and windows are latched. You don't want a door popping open um, during a test. You want to make sure all the windows are latched, and and um, I, I got in the habit of, of always going to the windows and latching them because um, sometimes you're fooled. It looks like the window is closed, but you go when you go over there to latch it, you find it's open an eighth of an inch or so, and um, if, if lots of windows are open an eighth of an inch, it can make a pretty big difference in the test. Um, attached garages, it says to have that overhead door closed. Um, or any any other doors in that garage or any windows in the garage. If if you know there's a broken window, for example, note that. Or if there's a garage door that pops open, it doesn't stay latched and opens up during the test, then then note that. Um, but um, um, so overhead door closed. So normal 
normal conditions the home, the, the home sees for, for most of the time, especially in, uh, in extreme conditions, usually that door is left closed. Um, crawl spaces, if it's an unconditioned crawl space, uh, open it to the outside. So if, if it has vents that, that um, are closed in an unconditioned space, it's, it's saying open them, uh, have that crawl space open to the outside during the test. A conditioned space, if, if there's a hatch going to that crawl space from inside the house, it's saying open it. So that crawl space is open at the inside. Attics, uh, if you've got an unconditioned attic, uh, leave the openings as is and document. So if you've got an unconditioned attic and it has a window in it and that window is open, um, you want to document that. You don't want to change it. But, but if you document that, if somebody else goes back to the to that house and does the test and that window was closed, you may get different results depending on how much venting that attic has. And um, so we want to, that test to be repeatable, so we want to set it up in the same conditions. Condition attics, uh, you want open to the inside. So if there's a pull down stairway going to an attic where the, the rafters are, are spray foamed, um, you want to, during the blow at our test, you want to, you want that attic hatch to be open to the inside. So that's part of the, it's part of the condition space. That, that pull down stairway is an interior door, essentially. And you want to open that. Uh, interior doors open. Um, I think we're all aware of that. Um, so if you have a conditioned basement, you want to certainly make sure that basement door is open. Uh, if you've got a fireplace, um, Close those uh, dampers and inlets, chimney dampers, uh, and uh, and intakes that, that there might be in there. Close them if, if there's a way to close them. It, uh, you're, it doesn't allow you to seal them. Um, just close them. So um, flue gas vents, um, you want in their normal off position. Uh, so if, for example, um, so by flue gas vents, they're talking about the, uh, the chimney for the furnace and water heater. And you, you may have, you don't, you don't want to seal those for sure during a test. If you have a vent, a vent damper, um, mechanical vent damper, or uh, there may still be some of those older thermal vent dampers out there, but you want those to be in the normal off position during the test. And again, that can make a difference in your blower or test. So you, you kind of get the feeling at going through these that each one of them may not be huge, but, but there's a certainly a cumulative effect of all of these things. And, um, you know, once you start uh, uh, doing tests and setting up a building for a test. You want um, fans off, so, so exhaust fans, clothes dryers, um, anything that can change the pressure in the house. Um, could be a, a powered attic fan. Um, you, want, you want anything that can change the pressure in the house off during the test. And if for some reason there's no way to, to turn that attic fan off, then, then document that it was on so that test can be repeatable and you know what condition the house is set up in. Um, the only thing that can be sealed is a continuously operating ventilation system. That can be left running. I mean that, I'm sorry, the continuously operating ventilation system can be sealed. Um, so you'll, you'll have that, you, you'll want to turn off that system, leaving it in its normal operating position, and most of those systems have dampers, but not all. Um, but if it's running all the time, then, then you can seal them. Um, so if you have, for example, it's a new construction house and it's got a, uh, um, it's got the piping installed for a clothes dryer, but the clothes dryer isn't in yet, um, you, you don't seal that off. You, you're not allowed to seal that. Um, the, the, uh, you would leave it in its, in its uh, normal position. So that would be considered a, a non-motorized damper and you want to leave that as it is. Motorized dampers uh, should be closed and unsealed. So you may have a, uh, an intermittent ventilation system that includes a damper to the outside uh, on the air handler, 
uh, connected with the ductwork, um, and you want you want that motorized damper closed but not sealed. If it's not continuously running, if it's intermittent, you want it closed and unsealed. Um, undampered or fixed damper openings, um, leave them as is. So um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. It doesn't have a damper on, or if the damper is is a fixed damper that is only letting so much air in, and that again might be on a, a fresh air opening um, where, where you only want a certain amount of air, so there's a damper in there to regulate that, and, and you don't change that. You want to leave that fixed damper right where it is. Um, whole house fans, um, um, close the damper. <clears throat> so those, those fans are typically designed um, to run, this is more of a northern climate thing when, um, when it gets hot during the day and it cools down at night, you'll have a whole house fan and it's, it's a two foot square fan up in the attic um, or between the house and the attic rather and it um, pulls air out of the house and, and you must leave windows open certainly during that test so the, that whole house fan isn't changing the pressure in the house and it, it helps cool off the house at night. If it has a seasonal cover, um, and most of them do, that, that can be installed. Or if you've got a, a evaporative cooler, a swamp cooler, um, those of you in hot, dry climates, um, in the older homes may run into that periodically. And again, if that has a seasonal cover, you can go ahead and install that. <coughs> Trickle vents or through wall vents can be closed uh, and not sealed. Supply registers and return grills leave open. I mentioned before, um, do your blow dryer test first before you seal your registers for your duct plaster test. Once in a while, you'll you'll smell um, sewer gas, or, or maybe you'll have a floor drain that that the water is evaporated out of the P vent because water hasn't drained into that vent for years, and you, so you want to yeah you notice that you want to fill that P trap with water. Combustion appliances, we're, we're all aware of that. You want furnaces and water heaters um, turned off or turned to pilot so they don't come on during, during your test. Wind. Um, pressures both inside and outside the house are changing. Um, and, and we can't change that. <laughs> we, we try to, um, but, but we can't change the fact that pressures inside and outside the house are changing. But that doesn't stop people from trying. Um, many things have been tried and um, some of the common things we hear people talking about is, um, is put it in a, in a pop bottle uh, during a windy day or, or put it in a sponge. Um, this is kind of an elaborate um, system. There, there are different types of, of uh, commercially available in commercial buildings. A lot of times they'll measure, measure um, outdoor difference between indoor and outdoor pressure and there are a lot of commercially available um, things that you can use and um, there here's another commercially available uh, device devised to, um, to damper wind and this is another thing I've seen some uh, videos of is an inverted pie plate on, on little legs um, and, and that's supposed to be the miracle cure um, and, and then this last one is showing um, is showing a tube coming up uh, taped to a wall and it's pointing down. So if it, you know, on a rainy day, you don't want water getting in there and then the tube is, is down close to the ground. And if there's, you know, if there's gravel or if there's wood chips up next to the house, you can use those to shelter the, the end of that um, tube a little bit also. So, um, when I worked in the Minneapolis Sound Insulation Program, there were we had about eight techs that were out in the field doing testing, doing uh, two tests a day, and, and all of the floater tests were graphed. Um, and so I could look at the graph and see what the baseline reading was. And people were using various types of things to try to figure out what what works for dampering the wind. And and everybody swore that their their device really worked, but when <laughs> When you compare the graphs of, of different types of things, uh, my experience was there's very little um, difference between things that they tried to do to, to damper uh, the effect of the wind. If you're 
and testing those things side by side. Um, Gary Nelson, the owner of the Energy Conservatory, has done some extensive testing where, where he's graphed things for uh, days on end um, in, in all different types of scenarios, uh, putting different types of measuring devices next to each other. One was even a soaker hose, a sprinkler soaker hose that uh, was spread out over a large um, area and, and a tube connected to that. Um, none of these things really seem to matter very much. Um, the one where they were that worked the best, that was most repeatable and seemed to work the best all the time was um, if you're just using a single tube, was to um, do like is done on this lower one where you're you're running a tube um, close to the house, in the center of the house, on the side of the house away from the wind. That that always seemed to be the best position. You know, where you get the most stable readings. On um, big building testing, we usually use multiple gauges and, and do a, have, use the Tech 3 software where it averages pressure on the four sides of the building. Yeah, and that works great too, but that's kind of above and beyond what you're going to do for a single fan residential blow or test. So, when inside and outside the house, <coughs> Wind inside and outside the house uh, do some pretty crazy things. And, um, you know, you've got wind coming up, blowing over the house and doing all kinds of things. And, and um, what we found is going on the side away from the wind up near close to the, the house is, is where you get the most um, stable readings. Next, we'll be talking about air density, the air density correction. Um, remember back at the beginning, we showed that mass air in equals mass air out, and mass is the weight of the air. And in order to correct for that, we need to correct for the density of the air. And the density of air is affected by differences between indoor and outdoor temperature, or uh, what elevation you're at, whether you're up in the mountains or, or at sea level. Um, so we'll talk about those corrections. Um, temperature correction is the first one, and um, and the DG700 doesn't make that correction, so you need to use either software or charts to make the, the uh, temperature correction. So if the DG700 is reading 2000, the corrected reading at 95 degrees would be 2047 CFM at 50. And the corrected reading at zero degrees would be 1863. So there's a difference in 10% of those readings. So if you were testing that house in, in uh, wintertime conditions and summertime conditions pre and post test, uh, you, you might have a difference of, of 10% if nothing was done to that house. So that can be um, significant. Or if you're doing a code compliance test yeah, and you're close to that three air changes per hour, not making that temperature correction can make the difference between a pass and a fail, depending on what temperature it is. Um, elevation correction, um, the DG700 is reading 2000 again. The corrected reading at 7,000 feet would be uh, 2081, or a difference of 4%. So if you're um, in, in conditions where you have extreme temperatures and you're at, at 7,000 feet, um, that magnifies the difference even more. So it becomes more important to be making that, that air density correction. And, and um, ResNet, the ResNet uh, in Chapter 8 provides um, charts. So if you're, if you're not using software, it has charts you can use to make temperature correction or elevation correction. Um, or you can use software that will make those corrections also. Um, testing standards and, and, and protocols help you determine how to, how to set up the house, um, how to uh, run the test, what the accuracy of your equipment needs to be to get an accurate test, and um, 
and then determines the accuracy and repeatability of the test. So, so there, are, there are lots of advantages to um, using test standards and protocols. Um, CGSB, Canadian General Standards Board, uh, is another um, another test standard that that's been around since the, the 1980s and and really hasn't been changed since the mid 80s. Um, but but that's the test standard that's always been in in our Tektite software. And uh, recently we also added the ResNet single point, repeated single point, and multi point test to the software. ASTM E779 and ASTM E1827 are two standards that are being referred to more and more. Um, the BPI protocol refers to, uh, allows you to, to do the test to either one of these standards. Um, the um, CGSB test has eight data points between 15 and 50 pascal, so it takes um, 100 data points at each of those pressures, each of those eight pressures between 15 and 50 pascals, and determines the accuracy and repeatability and CFM50 uh, based on, on those numbers, and it does a temperature correction. The ESTM E779 is, um, um, requires data at at least six data points, between 25 and 60 pascals and, um, and needs to be done in both positive and negative. So you need to pressurize and depressurize um, to follow that standard. Um, the ASTM E1827 is, um, has two, two options. Um, one is a, a single point, a repeated single point test. So you take a baseline and then a reading and then a baseline and then a reading and then a baseline and reading. Um, five times and um, determine the accuracy uh, and repeatability based on that information. So that's that's another um, um, test standards. And each of those has, has varying ranges of information on, on how to set up the building and um, how to perform the test and what weather conditions are allowed. Some of the standards um, have, have ways of um, as restrictions on, on when you can do the test based on uh, um, temperature and wind and height of the building. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit about accuracy and precision and what the difference are between the two. So with this chart, um, as, as we go up, we're going from less precise to more precise. Um, Precision and repeatability are, are somewhat interchangeable terms. Um, I think it's easier to understand if we think about precision as being a repeatable number. Um, it may not be technically accurate, but, but I think it's an easy, easier way to understand it. So um, precision basically, you can think of it as being a tight grouping of numbers. So, um, so in, in this first example, and the, the both examples on the top, they're, they're, um, you're getting good precision. Or you, you have a good grouping. If you're aiming for the bullseye and, and you're hitting over here, that's, that's not very accurate. And an example of that may be if, if, um, if you had a window open during the test and you're repeating the test a dozen times on a given day, um, you may get a good grouping, but it's not the right number. So, so that's kind of the way to think of that. And so if we've got poor precision, we've, we're scattered, or our, our data is scattered, and then we can either have, you know, and then as we move farther to the right, we're, we're more accurate. So this is precise and accurate. We've got a good grouping and we're in the target. Um, this, we're, we're all right, we got the target surrounded. Um, so we're getting, we're getting good, good numbers, but, but we've got quite a bit of scatter. So, if we set the house up right, but it was a windy day, we might see something like this. If we set up the house wrong, and uh, it was a windy day, and then we're really off target. Um, another, yeah, an example of this might be a windy day where we, we repeat the test um, a number of times, um, and, and we're kind of scattered. Or 
um, you know, maybe we have a, a calm day and the house is set up right, but we test it on, on, um, on different days, different times of the year. So we're getting that scatter based on not making our density correction. So there are a lot of ways we could, we could think about how to get data like this, but what we really want to shoot for is, um, is getting um, uh, data that's precise and accurate. Um, you know, if we averaged all of these numbers, we might end up being just as good as this one because because they're kind of equally distributed around, around that number. Um, and, and the most important thing is, is for sure is accuracy, but, but we want to be able to do the test in a in a repeatable way. Um, also. So some of the advantages of using software, um, you can do a, um, software will typically allow you to do a, a manual or an automated test. The, the big advantage to automated testing where you're connecting your DG700 to, um, to the software and letting the stuff, software run the test is you don't have to remember, let's see, for this test standard, what, what data points do I need to gather? Um, how long um, of a period of time do I need to gather data for that test? Um, what's the accuracy and precision? How do I calculate that? So the, the automated testing um, steps you through the test, tells you when to cap it and take your baseline, when to take the rings off, and, and, uh, and then it, it ramps up the fan and, and does the test. So for the automated test, um, for the computer to be able to control um, and run the test, you need to have a cable or a, or a, um, a Wi-Fi connection between your gauge with a Wi-Fi link, a Wi-Fi connection between your gauge and uh, the software, and um, and you need to also have the cable, the the fan control cable, that um, audio cable that goes from your DG700 to the speed controller. Um, and that allows the software to control the speed of the fan. Your computer can't talk directly to that speed controller. It needs to talk to it through the DG700. So you need the DG700 connected to your computer and you need that uh, fan control cable that goes between your DG700 and your fan speed controller. Software is going to calculate the accuracy and precision of the test. So you'll know right away whether that test is, is precise. So you can, after you've gathered all the test results in TechType, for example, you can go to the test results page before you've saved it. You can look at the correlation coefficient, which tells you how precise that test is. If it's not greater than 0.99, then you can run the test again and add, add eight more data points to that test. And usually that's enough to get you, um, to get you a, a precise enough test. So. Um, you know when you leave that left that house that you've got you've got good data, and you know how accurate and, and precise it was. So some software options. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about, and, and we'll do a little demonstration, is the iTech ResNet, and that's for an iPhone or an iPad, um, an Android phone or an Android tablet. This one is only manual data entry, so you're not connecting your your pad or your phone to the computer. Um, you're you're using your DG700 to gather um, gather doing a test, a manual test, and uh, then you're entering it in as you go through the test. And we'll go through an example. <coughs> one of the features that that people really like on it is that. It includes the option for a geotag and a, and a timestamp, so you know you were at that house on that day. Um, the the geotag feature of it, when you're when you're using that, um, it'll show a map and it'll show a pin um, where your location is, and you want to confirm that that pin is in fact at your location. So. Um, um, you know, some some tablets will have um, a GPS in them, and some will rely on a connection to the internet. 
um, to get their, their location. And if you're not connected to the internet on, on some tablets, you might not be at the location you think you are. What will be in recorded, what will be recorded in the geotag section is the last house where you had a connection to. So, um, so you want to make sure that, um, that when you're, um, you know, if you're going to be using the geotag, you want to just confirm on that map and the geotag page that you are in fact at the location um, on the same block, at least, <laughs> you'll be able to see that is where you think you are. It, it won't give you an address. Um, it'll just give you the longitude and latitude, but you should be able to tell pretty, pretty easily on that graph as you zoom in um, that you're at the right place. Then you can email either a, a .bld file, which is a tech type file, or a .html format. Um, the .bld file will not have the, the geotag information or the picture. Um, one thing that I didn't include on this list, I guess, with the iTech ResNet is you can include a photo, uh, some type of identifying photo. So um, whether you want to take a picture of the gauge or you want to take a picture of the front of the house or um, a picture of the address or maybe you want to take a selfie with the address. <laughs> Um, you can get creative here, but you, it, it allows you to save one photo and keep that um, with the report. So in the HTML format, that will include a, a timestamp, a geotag, and a photo, or the BLD file will just, um, you know, it'll have a time of when you save that file, but, but, um, but that's it. Then you can, you can email it and, um, and either open the BLD file in in Tektite, or with the HTML format, if you want to convert that to um, that uh, a PDF, you can do that, and you can do that by either printing to a PDF, and um, if, if you're not already doing this, there are there are a number of PDF writers that are free downloads. Um, the one I use is is called Cute PDF, C U T E. PDF and you can just do a Google search for that, download it on your computer. When you download it, um, it will put that PDF writer as one of your printer options. So when you go to print, you choose Cute PDF Writer and it'll create, it'll, it'll change whatever that document is, it'll change it to a, to a PDF. So then you'll have it in that format. Or if you're more familiar for, with, um, you know, you open your, your email that you just sent to your computer and um, if you've got a, an Android, it'll usually come across as an attachment. So the data will be on one attachment, the picture will be on another. Um, if uh, most uh, iPads, iPhones will come across where the, the information will be embedded in the, in the email. So it'll be in the, um, the body of the email. And, and you can just print that. Um, to a PDF, or or you can scan, open the documents, and scan them to a PDF if that's something you're more familiar with. But that that if you want it in a PDF format, those are some options. And TechType 4.0 now has a, a PDF writer embedded in it, so it allows you to print right to a PDF right from TechType 4.0 now. Um, so I'm going to do a demo using the iTech, um, using the boat or simulator in iTech uh, ResNet. Um, so this is our, our blow it or um, simulator and it. It has iTech ResNet kind of embedded in it. So I'm not going to be using the iTech ResNet um, app with this, but but all of the data that I'm collecting in this, you can put into iTech ResNet. So, so you'll get an idea of how to, how to follow the ResNet protocol and what information you need to put into iTech ResNet. So, um, so I'm just gonna show you the setup we have, um, the conditions we've set up. Our gauge is inside the house, that, that's pretty typical. We're doing a depressurization test, again, pretty typical. We're using our Model 3 fan. We've set it to a two-story building, so it gives us a little more baseline. We've got a leaky house at 4,000 CFM. 
we've got indoor temperature of 68 and outdoors it's it's april in minnesota so we're about 30 degrees <laughs> um elevation of about 680 and we're going to put wind conditions as light so we're not we're not bouncing around too much so that's our environmental conditions we've already connected our green tube to the outside our red tube to the fan um, we're going to turn our gauge on. All right, so a so couple of things that are different about using the ResNet format, um, using iTech ResNet. We'll want to change our mode. We'll just push the mode button once to change it to pressure flow. We're not going to use pressure flow at 50. So that's, that's an important thing to remember. We can see our baselines bouncing around a little bit. <coughs> um, we're going to use the time averaging now We're going to take our baseline. So we've got the fan capped. We're going to take our baseline reading and we're going to move our time averaging. We'll click it once, changes it to five second average. We'll click it twice and that gives us a 10 second average. Now we'll want to take five 10 second averages. So I'm going to, I'm going to write down these five 10 second averages at negative 2.2. And then every 10 seconds, you see it blinked with another one now, negative 2.1. And if you're using your app, you could be entering these numbers in now. You need five 10 second averages. So now we've entered two, now we're, we're gonna enter our third one, negative 2.3. And you'll wanna include the sign too, because on some days you'll have a wind gust and you might have a positive number that you need to average in there. And. Um, it's looking at the difference between the highest and lowest reading to determine the accuracy and then it's using the average of these five numbers to calculate um, your baseline. So I'm going to move over now to the um, so this is the ResNet one point test calculator that's that's in the simulator so I'm going to enter these numbers in. So again remember you need to add a negative sign if it's a negative number numbers are pretty close it's a it's a pretty calm day um, on a windy day if you have um, so it's calculating the average of those and our, our range is the difference between high and, and lowest is only 0.2 so so that's well within the standard level of accuracy if this number is greater than 5 it'll be a reduced level of accuracy if it's 10 then, then um, it won't be a valid test. So if you find that your, your um, accuracy level is reduced or, um, or where you can't, you can't do this test, then you can increase from a, from a 10 second average to, um, to one greater than that. So, Okay, so now, now we're ready to do the test. So I'm going to go back. So I've got control of the fan. And uh, we know we need an uh, open fan because, um, because we, know, we know ahead of time we're at 4,000 CFM. And I'm going to ramp up that fan. You can see our fan is running here now. And our numbers are changing. Oops, we're still on 10 second average. So this is an important step that you don't want to forget. <laughs> we'll want to change from 10 second back to one second average. It was giving me a 10 second average. So as, a, as I was moving up the speed controller, it wasn't responding. So we want to, after we were at 10 second average, we want to go back to one second average before we start our fan up. And we're getting up to, uh, and now we're in the pressure flow mode. So we didn't use the baseline function. We're not using the CFM at 50 function. We're using the baseline numbers we entered in there. And we're, um, we're just shooting for something close to, uh, we wanna get within a Pascal or so of uh, 50 Pascals. Yeah, 
pretty close there. Okay, we're pretty good. The, the software is going to make an, a, an adjustment to 50 pascals anyhow. So now we need to go to 10 second average. Our baselines were 10 second averages. So our, uh, our CFM 50 needs to be a 10 second average. And it'll flash with a new number. Okay, now negative 48.6. And I'm 40.50 for our reading. Okay, so so 40.50 was our reading on our gauge. So now it, it, it's correcting our our. Um, so this is our nominal building pressure. Our baseline was was uh, negative 2.2. So, you know, it takes that into consideration. So it, it corrects us. So we have an induced pressure of 50. Um, and <clears throat> it, it's also making the temperature correction. So the reading on our gauge was 40, 50, but our corrected flow is, um, is 3,994. So, um, so that's, you know, that's basically it on, uh, I'm using this. So if you're using iTech ResNet, you go to the screen where you enter baseline numbers and you enter these five in, and then where it's asking for nominal building flow, you're, you're putting the, the flow that you're actually reading off the gauge, and you're putting the um, you're putting the, the pressure right off the gauge and the flow right off the gauge. Okay, so that's uh, that's iTech ResNet. So I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint here. Um, so some other options are using TechType 4.0. And again, that can be either manual data entry or an automated test. And then we can choose between the CGSB standard. And with that CGSB, we can, we can also do a ventilation. We want to do the ventilation uh, correction or ventilation design rather for, for ASHRAE 622. Um, dash 10, 2010, we can do that. Um, or the ResNet um, single point, repeated single point, or multipoint. So you can do that single point test, all that information we gathered. Um, we can do that in, in TechType, where it will step you through that. So you don't have to remember exactly how to do the test and how to set up the gauge. It, it'll take care of all of that for you. And it'll take the five 10 second averages um, you get it, uh, it'll ramp it up near 50, and then it'll take a 10 second average, and then your test is done. So it goes really quickly, and it, it gathers all that information for you. Um, Tektite Express has um, the E779 standard also, where it's uh, um, positive and, and negative, and the EN13829 is a European standard um, that um, the German passive house. Um, people use in, in for the American passive house they, they use uh, e779 so um, and the Tektite Express is a simplified report that that doesn't include the um, energy savings and um, uh, ventilation uh, information into it so it's a little shorter report So in Tektite, if you're doing, um, it, it, in this case, we're doing the, the eight point CGSB test and um, it, it will show them all the data points will be in, in a straight line. And, and you'll notice this is a log log graph. So the dis distance between four and five and 50 and 60 are, are, are similar, even though they're on opposite ends of the scale. And, and that allows you, if you were graphing this on a regular scale, it would it would be shaped like a half of a U instead of a straight line. So being able to put them on a straight line and draw the line of best fit gives us a better idea how closely our, our data is, is aligned. And in this case, you can see it's, it's uh, very good. And then if we go to our test results page, there's a lot of information that is gathered in this. Um, it will calculate the accuracy. So this is uh, 409 plus or minus 0.3%. Uh, 
if we entered in the volume, it'll calculate air changes per hour. If we entered in the, the floor area, it's CFM per square foot, the floor area. If we entered in the surface area, it's CFM per square foot of surface area. So, you know, the more you enter in, the more data will show up on the report. Um, leakage areas are building leakage curve. Uh, correlation coefficient tells us how precise that test is. I mentioned that before. You want that above 0.99. 0.99000 would be a good test. Um, if it's if it's 0 0.98, 0 0.9897, then you want to add, um, run the test again, add some additional data points to that before you save it, and um, that usually gets that in a in, in a better range. Another check to make sure your test makes sense is, is exponent, and and that exponent number should be between 0.5 and 1.0. Um, it's usually pretty close to 0.65 on the average, and um, if it's not between 0.5 and, and 1.0, there's something really haywire about your test, and, and um, you, you'll want to redo the test because something's going wrong. Um, maybe there's water in your hose or your flow sensor is bad or something. There's something really wrong with your test if, if you're not within 0.5 and 1.0. So that's another double check. Um, and then it, it runs through some formulas to, to figure out um, estimate annual infiltration um, and cost of air leakage. And this cost of air leakage is, is um, you know, at 4,900 CFM at 50, this is the energy cost for that. If you cut this number in half, then this number will be cut in half. So it gives you an idea how much savings you could get if you reduce it by 20%, these numbers would be 20% less. But these are, are, you know, ballpark numbers at best. And um, cooling does not take into consideration latent load. So if you're in a humid climate, it's way underestimating um, your cooling costs. So that's, um, that's that. And then if you enter in the information about um, ventilation, it'll, it'll come up with a ventilation design down in this area also. So that's it. So now um, we've got time for some questions. I'll look over uh, the questions that have been asked during the session and, um, and we'll talk about those. And also this will give you some time to, to type in some questions also. Um, so I'll answer some questions.